going to talk mostly uh, about what a function is uh, and different representations that we can use for functions. Um, again, there should be a lot of review from what you've seen in uh, Algebra 1, about halfway through an Algebra 1 course, and then a lot of what we did last year. Um, functions end up being a, a good deal of this course um, in analyzing different types of functions. And then when we get into trigonometry, uh, we'll talk about trigonometric functions. So this is going to be a concept that is um, very prevalent uh, throughout the rest of the course, throughout really all of mathematics. Um, so what is a function? So a function, uh, by definition, let's see here, is a relation in which every x value is paired with only let's start right this way with exactly one y value okay a relation in which every x value is paired with exactly one y value uh, sometimes you'll see it for each um let's write it for for each x value uh there is one y value um a couple different ways you can phrase this, but what we're saying is that every x value has one and only one y value. Okay. Um, some different representations of a function. First of all, uh, probably the most um, kind of basic, simplistic version uh, or representation that you would see of a function is that it's a machine. Um, so I'll just kind of make a machine here. I like to think of it as like a like a food processor or a juicer or something like that. So uh, my machine is called f of x. That's my function. I'm going to take an input. Okay, and that input is going to be run through that machine, and it's going to spit out an output. Okay. Um, when we do that, this input, let's say, is like the number three. My machine or my function, let's just say, is 2x plus 1. The output then, so the machine takes this 3, does something to it, multiplies it by 2 and adds 1, gives me an output of 7. Okay. Try a different input, a 5, run that through, gives me an output of 11. And the idea is, every single time I put the same input in, I put 3 in again, it should spit back a 7 every single time, okay? If it does something different, gives me a different result than 7, it's no longer a function. Um, I like to think of it as a machine, like a food processor or a juicer. For instance, if I put uh, an orange juice or an orange in here, this machine is going to change it into orange juice. No matter how many times I put an orange in, I'm getting orange juice out. I'll never put an orange in and get apple juice out, okay? So that's kind of the kind of layman's way of thinking about what a function is. Um, so class is about, and a lot of this class is about trying to decipher and determine what are all these different machines, what do they look like, what are their similar characteristics, what are their differences, that type of thing. Um, another representation, so we're going to see graphs, okay, so we'll have a graphical representation. Uh, we'll see things called mappings, okay, so um, we'll see just listings, a list of order pairs. Um, so uh, let's see here, one representation, um, you know, if I say graphical, things that we've been working with so far, lines, okay? Every line, if I think about it, is this X value right there going to be paired with one Y value and only one Y value? And does that exist there? Is that still true there? Is it true there? So that's one graphical representation. Um, we've also worked with parabolas a little bit, um, or quadratics. So for that x value right there, I'm going to get one y value and only one y value. For this x value here, I'm going to get that y value and only ever that y value. So those are two um, functions. Uh, or representations of functions. Um, another representation that we'll see, so make sure I don't have it written down here, yeah, um, is what we call a mapping, OK? 
Okay. And what I'm actually going to do here is first kind of understand the idea of what, by definition, what our our function definition is saying. We're going to see at times a list. Okay. I'm going to call this a set, just a collection of objects of ordered pairs. So let's say I have one, two. Let's say I have the ordered pair three, four. Um, five, six, and then seven, eight. Okay, and I, the question is, is this a function? Is this a representation of a function? Well, what I do is I look at the x values, and because none of them repeat, I know for sure that the y values that go with them are going to be unique for the x value. So, meaning that every x value of one will only ever be paired with two, so this must be a function. Give you something that's not a function. If I go one comma two, two comma three, three comma four, and so far this is a function. Every x value is paired with only one y value. So if I say everybody look at the x value of one, what is the y value that goes with it? Right now, everybody's going to be looking at that two. Okay? If I have another ordered pair over here that is one comma seven, and I say now everybody look at the the y value that goes with one. So if I tell you to look at the x value of one, tell me what is the y value that goes with it, because now there's a choice. Some of you would say two, some of you would say seven. That's a problem. That violates the definition of a function in which one x value has one and only one y value. So this was a function. This is not a function. Okay, this is still a relation. Okay, a relation is just uh, a, a set of points, set of ordered pairs. Um, these are so my x values are referred to as your independent. variables okay because they can be anything okay they're they're not reliant on another quantity your y values those are referred to as your dependent variable because they are reliant on another value for instance okay this seven the fact that i got seven depend on, on which one of these numbers I put in. I had to put the 3 in to get the 7 out. So 7's amount depended on the input. Okay, so your inputs are independent, your outputs are dependent. Um, so the, that is one way of, of looking at a function or a representation of a function. Now that directly links to what we call a mapping. Okay. Um, Basically, a mapping is a visual of showing you what values pair with one another, okay? Or if I have, so I'm going to put S in here in the middle. Basically, what it says, if I start with 1, I'm going to use this black um, list of values here or order pairs. Uh, if I go to 1, it tells you, okay, once that runs through the function, it takes itself or maps itself onto... Two. Okay, so the function takes one and make, turns it into two. Um, it takes three, because that's the other independent variable, and it's going to map it onto four. It'll take five, map it onto six, and it'll take seven, and it'll map it onto that eight. Okay, so this is this would be a function. Okay, graphically what we're saying, if I look at every one of these arrows, it's starting at an X value, and it's being paired with one and only one Y value. Okay, um, if I do this bottom one, okay, so I'm going to look at the, my inputs, my independent values, my X values, I'll put those in this bubble, one, two, and three, and then my dependent values in this bubble, so 2, 3, 4, and 7. 
And if I just go through one maps to two, okay, two maps to three, three maps to four, but then it says one also maps to seven. The fact that we have two arrows, two mappings from one to two things over here, that violates the definition of a function. So looking at that representation would tell me uh, I do not have a function, okay? or this information is not a relation that exhibits that of a function. Um, another one would be maybe something like this. Okay, so let's say that I go like one, one, two, one, three, one, four, one. Okay, so my independent values are one, two, three, and four. My output is one. If you think about graphing these, you're gonna get a horizontal line uh, through the y value of one. And this would look like this. They all map to the same value one. And that's okay, this would be a function, okay? We're allowed to have multiple arrows pointing to the same Y value, but we cannot have multiple arrows emanating from the same X value to different Y values. So this is okay, this would be a function, this is not a function. Uh, function notation, okay, so function notation, we're gonna use the lowercase f, and then we put our variable in there, and then we'll write whatever our rule is. Okay, that function notation, now F for function, uh, but you can use G, you can use H. A lot of times we'll do um, story problems where we deal with cost and revenue and profit and that kind of stuff. Um, we'll use letters that represent those things. So let's, let's talk about that real quick. If we're doing um, cost, okay, so a lot of times it's C of X is cost, okay. I think it's pretty self-explanatory what cost is if we're talking finances. Revenue. Revenue is something that a lot of people are uncertain about. If I talk about revenue and profit, they get them mixed up. Revenue is just the money brought in. Okay, so if I'm if I'm selling, uh, let's say lemonade, okay, uh, and I'm selling lemonade for fifty cents for a cup. Uh, and I sell 100 cups, okay, I've brought in $50, okay, that's my revenue. Now, I may have purchased $10 of sugar and $15 of um, lemons and maybe $3 of water, so now I've got a cost of $28, I brought in $50, my Profit then would be $22. Keep track of all those amounts that I stated. So profit is revenue, your re whatever your revenue function is, minus whatever your cost function is. And hopefully, because our revenue, if, if we're good at our business, our revenue is going to be greater than our cost. So our profit will be money made. Um. And there's other representations you can see down here. We see a table uh, of ordered pairs, um, which is very analogous to this, okay? Um, taking a list and rewriting it as a table. Um, so one thing they ask you, so if this is my X value, okay? The function is the rule, okay? So wh whatever our rule is, we're taking these X values of zero and they're turning through our rule into those y values. So they're saying if you take your function and you plug into it an independent value of negative four, okay, what is that gonna spit back to you? What's the output? If negative four is the input, the output in this case would be 10, okay? Here it's saying if f, of, the way we read this, we say f of zero, okay, meaning zero was the value you plugged into your rule What's the y value that gets back? We get one, okay? Um, something to to think about um, graphically, um, 
we talk about function notation, we generally say this, y equals f of x. Okay, if it's a function, your y value is the same as f of x. Um, why is why why can't we just say y then? Okay, so if I have like y equals, let's say, um, let's just go x squared. Okay, um, if if I do that, well, let's not say x squared. Let's say square root of x. Okay. If I say that y is equal to square root of x, that graph looks like that. If I say y equals plus or minus the square root of x, that graph would look like this. Only one of those is a function. This one's a function. So I would say f of x and just let everybody know, hey, just because I see this, this notation, I automatically know it's a function. And everything we've done so far, if I'm graphing two variables, it's been y equals something. And we didn't know, we don't have any extra insight to that thing until we graph it or um, some other type of analysis on that function or the, on that graph to determine whether it's a function or not. But once they say this, now I automatically know that's, that's extra insight. I know for certain it's a function. Um, we can do um, our traditional algebra with functions, okay, um, which we're seeing here says f of negative 2. So if I take a negative 2, plug it into my function, it's about 5, so f of negative 2 is going to be 5. If I have f of negative 8, negative 8 plugged into my function will give me 20. I can do that algebra and get 25. So you can do um, function addition, you can do function subtraction, we can do multiplication, division, all that kind of stuff. Um, it says f of 3, so I go through here and I look for my independent value of 3, and there is none, which tells me then if that's undefined, if it's not determined what f of 3 is, then there's no y value. You don't know that specific y value, so we say it's undefined. Here's another example, and this is really the same idea, really the same concept, but instead of giving you the table and not the rule, now I'm giving you the rule and not the table. Okay, and there's a couple different things you can do here. Um, I think the the best thing is just to take them one for um, like one function at a time, figure out what f of 4 is. So you're going to look at that, and that tells me, okay, if I'm going to look there, so the notation, that remember, that's usually f of x. That's the rule. But right now, there's a relationship that says x must be the 4. Okay? So then I come into my rule, and where I see the x, I'm going to replace it with 4. So I'll have 4 underneath the root plus 1. That's going to be that yellow portion. Then there's this g of negative 2. Well, g tells me to come over to this function, and where I see now um, the x, because remember this is usually g of x, where I see the x here, I'm going to plug in negative 2. The only thing I'd be cautious of here is that 1, this is a minus sign, so it's got to stay a minus sign here. Now, when I plug this in, because I'm subtracting g of negative 2, I'm going to subtract that whole quantity. Okay, so it's going to be subtraction because that was subtraction there. Now I'm going to have the opposite of negative 2 squared plus 2. And this here is that blue stuff. Okay, just be careful with your, when you insert something into a function, when you substitute, my feet, especially when that value is negative, and especially when there's exponents, I'm substituting that x right there, so I'm going to make sure that I put parentheses around it when I substitute. Everything else stays the same. Notice everything else is identical. There's a negative out front. I left that negative out front. There's a power 2 behind the x. Left that power 2 there. There's a plus 2. But I put in the parentheses 
because it's going to remind me what I need to do with exponents and negatives. So now it's going to evaluate this stuff. Okay, so root 4 is 2, plus 1 is 3, and then I'll have minus. So now negative 2 squared is 4, but I'll have the opposite of 4, okay, plus 2, which is negative 2. So this all evaluates here to negative 2, but this says minus negative 2. So that turns into 5, okay. Some people prefer to do it, like I wrote it all out here. At, at once before I started doing the evaluation. Some people prefer just to say, okay, I'm going to plug the 4 in here, so 2 plus 1 is 3, and they get that value. And say, so, okay, I'm going to plug in negative 2 here, so now I get negative 2 squared is um, 4, take the opposite, negative 4, plus 2 would be negative 2, and now I say, okay, what were the signs that stuck the two functions together? The sign that stuck the two functions together was subtraction, so you get 3 minus negative 2, still gets you 5. Um, the second one, so now I'm looking at uh, g of 3. So I'm going to come up to g, plug in 3. So I'll have the opposite. Now it'll be 3. Remember, put the value you're inputting in parentheses. Um, square it, and then add 2. So I've got 3 squared is 9. Take the opposite of that, so it's negative 9. And then add 2. Gives you negative 7. Okay, so we've got g of 3, which is negative 7. Now I'm going to find out what f of 1 is. Well, f of 1, square root of 1, is 1, plus 1 is 2. So now g of 3, like I said, was negative 7. I got my plus sign. I haven't dealt with this 2 yet, but it's 2 now times whatever f of 1 was. Well, f of 1, we said, was 2. We evaluate it to be that. So now I get negative 7 plus 2 times 2. So it would give me negative 3 as a result. Okay. We can do f of 64. Okay, plug in 64 here. You're going to get 8 plus 1 is 9. But there's a negative out front, so I'm going to make it negative 9. And then I'll add to it g of 2. Well, g of 2, plug in 2 here. Okay, so it would be the opposite of 2 squared plus 2. So it's 4. Take the opposite, negative 4, add 2, be negative 2. So now I get negative 11. Um, generally, people struggle with these next um, examples here because of the the input being variable. Okay, So the benefit of this is actually we can, um, well, when we're, when we're done, I'll kind of explain. Sometimes we like to, especially if we're using like a computer program where inputs are based off of another formula, um, it'd be nice to be able to rewrite my final um, function in terms of that initial input instead of um, leaving it as its, its original version. Um, maybe later on, if we have enough time in this video, I'll explain that in greater detail with some some specific examples. Um, f of b, so all I'm going to do is, now the, the input is b. So x is now b, and then I add 1. Okay. Can't evaluate radical b. I don't know what b is, Okay, but now um, I can go on to what g of a plus 1 is. So I'm going to go to g. Okay, so it's going to be a plus, and now I go to g which says it's the opposite of a plus 1 squared and then plus 2. Now, you just got to pay attention to what the directions are. They might want you to simplify. There's, there's a lot of simplification that can happen here. So I'm going to rewrite this as radical b. Um, I'll just go plus 1 for now. It'll be minus. Now, a plus 1 squared turns into a squared plus 2a plus 1 and then plus 2. So now I've got radical b plus, okay, so I've got 1. It's going to be minus that 1, so those are going to cancel each other out. And then i got plus 2, so I'll just put plus 2. And it'll be minus a squared minus 2a. So now, like, if I was writing some type of program that used these functions, um, 
instead of having my program go in and access another function like F, plug in B for that, and then have my uh, program access another function G and plug in A plus 1 and have the program do all that math, because uh, usually then it will say, well, well, B is some number, and then A is some number, and then it will ask it to evaluate. So instead of making it call into this function and then call into that function, we would do the preliminary work and say, okay, well, F of B plus G of A plus 1 looks like this, and now all my computer program has to do is substitute into this function and it's going to my output that I need. Um, it, it's just a, it's a nicer, more concise way of evaluating something like this um, to be able to rewrite it this way. Um, so it says use the graph to find f of 0, f of negative 2, f of 3. Uh, I'll do that first. So all this is saying these are your inputs. And remember, inputs are x values. So when I say find f of 0, I'm actually asking the question, what is the y value on the function f that pairs with x equaling 0? That's the question that's being asked when we do that. And I can see, I can hopefully or you can hopefully see the benefit of this notation taking place of a long phrase like this. So all we have to do is we have to go find the x value of 0. This is where my cursor is. And then I say, OK, on the function f, so this, this blue function, this blue curve is the function, what is the y value when the x is 0? Well, the y value when x is 0 is 1. So f of 0 equals 1. How does that correlate to something maybe we are a little bit more familiar with? Well, that's the ordered pair, 0, 1. Okay. When we talk about this um, graph, any point on this graph, obviously we call it x, comma, y. Okay. But because we know, but because we know this is a function, okay, or at least I'm inherently telling you it's a function. We haven't talked maybe about how we discuss whether it's a function by a graph. Um, but we will. I can say, well, it's x comma instead of y now. It's f of x. But you can see at that point, no matter how I talk about that point, whether I call it x comma y or x comma f of x, it's the same point. So it tells me that those two things must be the same, which comes up here to what we said there when we talk about our function notation. If it's a function, your y value is the f of x. Um, let's find f of negative 2. So f of negative 2. So we're going to go find negative 2 on the x-axis and now find the y value that's paired with it on the curve. So it would be negative 3. So that yields the point negative 2, comma 3. And then I try f of 3. So x value is 3. Looks like that's the point right there. So f value of 3 gives a y value of 3. So 3, comma 3. Now the next question says values of x such that f of x, f of x equals negative 3. So the question being asked here is what x value yields a y value of negative 3. And when I say x value, it could actually be x values. Okay, So we're going to try to find the y value of negative 3. So I think the best way of doing this is I come to my graph, and I want to drag out a line through the y values of negative 3. And you see that my line of a y value of negative 3 intersects my graph at two spots there and there. So that actually gives me two values. x would be 2 and x would be negative 2. Those both produce a y value of negative 3. 2, negative 3, and negative 2, negative 3. And people will say, well, I can't do it because it's got it's, it's an x value 
with the same y value. Well, does that violate a function? Well, think about what our mapping said. If I put my x's in my mapping here of negative 2 and positive 2, and I put my y values of negative 3, we have this mapping. If you remember, we said that's okay. You can have x values pointing to the same y value, which is you can't have multiple x values pointing to multiple, or the, sorry, the same x value pointing to multiple y values. So make sure when you're when you're answering these types of questions, you're you're ask are you, are you finding the x value, okay, um, or are you finding the y value? So the same thing happens then here, okay. Um, essentially, they're saying here is your x value, here is your y value, or your f of x, okay. Uh, now. I don't necessarily, if we look at the question, it says determine if it is a function. So we're uncertain about this. Okay, this might just be y, but if it's a function, we could actually refer to it as f of x. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to, and we kind of talked about it up here. We already kind of did something like this. When we talked about it right here. I'm going to look at my x values and see if my x values repeat. They do not repeat. Okay, so because my x values do not repeat, I automatically know that each x value is paired with only one y value because there's no repeats of x's. So yes, this is a function. So I could write this column as the f of x and my output could be the f of x's. Now, if I look at this one, I look at my x's and they do repeat. Now that's not automatically an identifier that yes, it's, or, or sorry, no, it's not a function because once they repeat, I have to make sure that these are actually different values. And in this case, they are different values, so this would not be a function. The mapping of this would be 1 and 5, and then 0, 2, and 4. And you would see 1 goes to 0, but 5 goes to 2, and it goes to 4, and that's a violation of um, a function. Okay. Ultimately, the way you can think about a function um, is if we were in class and I asked you everybody to look at the y value that goes with 5, if it's a function, everybody's going to be looking at the same number. If it's not a function, some people might be looking at 2, some people might be looking at 4, um, so that would be a problem. The one thing you want to be careful with because of the way sometimes we collect our data, um, you know, if this was an output of 2 and this was an output of 2, even though the fires repeat, they both still point to the same output. Um, so it would be a function in that case. So just be careful with that. Just because I see x values repeating, I have to make sure that the y values that they repeat for are different. So how does that relate to what we already know? We, we know what the vertical line test is. Okay, The vertical line test is the test, the determining um, strategy for finding out whether something graphically is a function or not. So the way we go about using the vertical line test is we simply Take a vertical line, and all we're going to do is we're going to traverse that line through our graph and make sure that everywhere that it intersects our graph, that it only does it at those x values and only intersects my graph one time. So if I look at it here, okay, for that x value of negative 2, I'm only intersecting that blue graph one time. Does that work there? Does it work there? Okay. So as I'm doing this, I'm going to um, come to the conclusion that this vertical line only ever intersects that graph one time in all x values, or for all x values. So yes, this would be a function. Okay. Uh, and if we think about that, what, what is that? What is that vertical line test really doing? It is testing to make sure that for an x value of two there are no repeat y values, okay? And it might be easier to recognize that situation down here, okay? When we go here, when I put my vertical line right here on the y-axis, or as the y-axis, we pass. We're fine. Right now, this would classify as a function, but we have to test this for all x values that exist. So I'm going to come out here. We start failing. Obviously, here you can see several different places that we fail where we intersect our vertical line twice, Okay, but at this stage right here, okay, I would get maybe, 
an x value of 3, and you can see at the y value that goes with that, let's say it's 1.5. But down here, an x value of 3, let's say that is a y value of negative 1.5. These two numbers are different. Okay? So the idea would be, if I'm looking at a mapping, if I have 3 here, and I have 1.5 and negative 1.5, you would see that 3 goes to two different outputs. Okay, We violate that idea that if everybody's, if I ask everybody to look at the y value of 3, that we'd all be looking at the same number. Here, some people would be looking at 1.5, some at negative 1.5. Okay, So this is a direct violation that for every x value, there is a unique y value, or one and only one y value that goes with that x value. In this case, we violate that. So this would not be um, a function. So the key thing here is in the, using the vertical line test, it is a graphical way of determining whether our graph um, adheres to the definition of a function.